Well, good morning. So great to see everybody gathered together as we come together to worship God. I ask you, if you would, to open in your Bible to Psalm 133. Psalm 133. And for those that are visiting with us, or Brother Tim, who hasn't been able to be with us uh, until today, we're going through, we started it back in January, we're going through and we're talking about uh, the very fundamental elements of Christianity. We've called this series Christianity 101. We began by talking about the first thing that we must understand in Christianity is the principle of authority. And we've worked our way through. We talked about the fact that Jesus only built one church and that there are definite characteristics of the one church that is revealed to us in the Bible that tells us how to identify the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I am convinced that a series on fundamentals would be incomplete if we don't talk about the unity that God desires for His church. And so this morning we're going to talk about unity. We're going to talk about, first of all, the importance of it, Secondly, we're going to talk about the basis of that unity. Thirdly, we're going to talk about the reasons why God would call us to be united. And then sadly, but it must be done, we're going to talk about those things that would hinder the unity of the body of Christ. And so we've got four uh, points we're going to look at. I think we can accomplish it all in uh, a short amount of uh, well, we can do it today. How about that? <laughs> so first off, uh, I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, this Friday night is game night, is it not? In this Friday night, yeah. Uh, Britt saying he's got his arm already warmed up. Uh, I am going to be teaching the class down at Texas School of Preaching, so I won't get back till about 7.30 to 7.45. So you, you guys that are pitching cornhole, oh, we all be good and warmed up by the time I get here to beach, I mean to play. So uh, anyway, don't forget game night is uh, this Friday night. And as Brother Larry mentioned, the Maybank lectures start uh, on Friday night, which is more uh, usually geared to the young people, so if y'all want to come and have game night, then that would be appropriate. And then Saturday afternoon, I believe starting at 1 o'clock, will be the uh, actual lectureship. Uh, starting at 2 o'clock, they're going to have question and answers that last for about two hours, if I remember right. So uh, it's a good lineup, and y'all come and be a part of that if you can. But let's turn to Psalm 133. Notice that the psalmist uh, tells us in verse number one, Behold, look is the word that he's talking about. Look, look at, consider, ponder this, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. I want you to let that sink in, what the psalmist is saying. What a beautiful, he says, and pleasant thing for God's people to dwell together in unity. Look at verse 2. He says, It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garment. He goes back and uses a very appropriate illustration. When God was anointing Aaron to be his high priest, he instructed Moses to take that oil and pour it over the head of Aaron. And you can see as he's describing this that he poured the oil on his head. It ran down to his beard. It actually dripped down to his skirts. And he's saying, what a precious moment in the history of God's people that was the first high priest. And you can almost see the people that were gathered there when Aaron is anointed as high priest and the joy they must have felt in seeing that uh, magnificent event. And so he says, unity among God's people is like that moment when the first high priest is set forth to lead the people of God in worship. He tells us in verse 3, 
Not only is it like the oil that ran down upon the head of Aaron, but he says it's like the dew of Ermon. And as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessings, even life forevermore. So David uses another beautiful illustration. You've, you've got up in the morning and you've looked out and you've seen the dew upon the grass. Maybe if you've been in the mountains, you've been into the mountains and you've woken up early in the morning and, and as that sun is rising over the mountaintops and you look down into that valley and the sun hits it and that dew is sparkling and it looks like a million diamonds have been spread out upon the face of the earth. What a beautiful thing that is to witness and what David is saying, witnessing the unity of God's people is exactly like that. It's as, you're, it's as if you're seeing a million diamonds laid out on the top of a mountaintop. And so, uh, brethren, the Bible clearly tells us that unity is a key component in the life of the people of God. I don't know who actually said this, but someone once said, coming together is a beginning, keeping together is progress, but working together is success. And I like that quote. When we, when we can work together as the people of God, then we know that we're going to be successful. And so uh, unity is an important topic in the New Testament. It's one of the key doctrines. And I want to point out, brethren, this unity that we're talking about, and I want you to hear me clearly when I say this, it is every one of us responsibility all of us have a responsibility in this unity that God desires and brethren we'll talk about it in a few moments but those that would hinder the work of God by sowing discord among the brethren well we know how God feels about that so we need to be together united as the people of God the unity that exists in the Lord's church, and we might even say it like this, the disunity that sometimes exists in the Lord's church affects us all. I want you to turn with me to Proverbs chapter 6, and this is the verse I was alluding to a moment ago. Proverbs chapter 6, we'll begin in verse 16, Solomon the wise son of David said these words, Proverbs 6, beginning in verse 16, These six things doth the Lord hate. Now, I'm here to tell you that if God says He hates something, you better stay as far away from it as possible. There are six things that the Lord hates. There are seven, yea, seven that are an abomination unto him. And he begins that list with this statement in verse 17, a proud look. We're going to talk about pride in a few moments. Pride is destructive. It destroys the person that is filled with pride and it destroys the unity of the body of Christ. It's no wonder that God headed that list of things that are abomination in his eyes, beginning with a proud look. He goes on to say, A lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief. Verse 19, A false witness that speaketh lies. And then he ends the list with this statement. And he that soweth discord among the brethren. That's powerful. See, disunity or the other broad spectrum unity, it affects us spiritually, brethren. We may not recognize how the unity, it helps us so much. But you think about that, and I think you'll see it affects us spiritually, it affects us mentally, and brethren, it affects us physically. You've been in a situation where the people of God are singing and praying together 
as the body of Christ. And when you walk out that door, you're, you're almost on cloud nine. Talked about the time I was able to go do a, a door knocking campaign in Bermuda, and it was two weeks. And uh, we gathered together at night and sang praises to God. The building was a little bit, it was about maybe not quite this wide, but it was longer, and, and there were over 200 people there. And the singing, they didn't have air conditioning. They opened the, the windows, and the people were calling, we can't hear our television, y'all are singing too loud. Uh, but when you left, you were on cloud nine. I mean, you were just, you, you, there was nothing in the world that was going to bring you down. It affects us physically. And the opposite is also true. You've seen disharmony. And when you leave, you feel sick to your stomach. It, it hits you in the very pit of your stomach. So brethren, we need to understand how important unity is. And we're going to show that the unity of the church was important first of all because our Lord prayed for it. Turn with me to John 17. You know uh, where we're going when we talk about John chapter 17. We've mentioned it on numerous occasions and I still stand by the idea. This is the Lord's Prayer. Now Jesus gave us the model prayer in Matthew chapter 6. Here's, here's a, an outline if you want to call it such. Here's some of the high points that you ought to talk about when you're praying to God. But John 17 is Jesus' prayer to the Father. How do I know that? Look at verse 1. These words spake Jesus. Now that tells you something about prayer. Prayer is verbal at least in an assembly. Now I know we can pray to ourselves when we're in a closet or we're having a prayer. But the words that are used in the assembly are verbal. We don't just say, well, let's everybody bow our head and have a moment of silence and, and you can pray if you want. That, that's what you see in the world. It's not what you see in the Lord's church. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son that thy Son also may glorify Thee. I'm not going to read any further into that because I want to skip down to verse 20. This gets to the point. I'm just illustrating, first of all, in verse number 1, this is Jesus praying to the Father. Verse 20, what did He pray for? Among other things, He says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on Me, through their word. Very clearly, Jesus is telling us that He has given authority to the apostles and their word is going to be the final word. Why? Because it's the word of the Father. And so they revealed it to us. And so to us, Jesus is saying, I'm not just praying for these apostles that are gathered here with me at this particular moment, but I'm also praying for those that believe on me through their word. Did you know Jesus prayed for you? That's what this verse says. If you believe what the apostles have told us, Jesus is praying for us. Brethren, that just gives me chills to think that my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was concerned enough that he would lift up my name in prayer to the Father. Now, I just find that fascinating. Not only for these 12 men that are gathered with me, Father, I'm not just praying for them, but I'm praying for all those who hear their words and believe on me. Verse number 21. Now listen to this prayer, that they all may be 3,000. Is that what that says? See, that's what the world says. We're all, we're all uh, going to the same place. We're all just traveling different roads. Jesus never believed that. Jesus said in John 14, I am the way, 
the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me, John 14 and verse 6. And so Jesus did not say, Father, I pray that they will all be divided and splintered among man-made religions. That's not what he said. He said, I pray that they all may be one. What kind of unity are you praying for, Jesus? As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. I want you to listen very carefully to what he said at the latter part of verse number 21. Our unity, brethren, is a declaration to the world that we stand united on the Word of God. We stand united on the Word of God. He says in verse 22, And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. Verse 23, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect, that's complete, in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved me as thou, or loved them as thou hast loved me. Brethren, if we just stop right there and close the book and said, Amen. We have established the importance of biblical unity and how dare men divide the bride of Christ. Whew, that's going to be something. The Apostle Paul, echoing the words of Jesus, tells us God wants us to be united. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul says in verse 10, Now I beseech you, the word beseech, when you look at, at it in the Greek language and you break that word down, Paul is saying, I'm getting down on my knees and begging. Now Paul, being an apostle, had the authority to say, I command you. But that's not what he said in this instance. He says, I am on my knees pleading with you and begging you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Paul pleaded for us as the people of God to be united. And I'm so thankful that when we turn to Acts chapter 4 and we see the Lord's church being established and we see the Lord's church in its beginning being persecuted by the people of the world and the Bible tells us in verse number 32 of Acts chapter 4 the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul and neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Brethren, when you look at this statement, it's clear that the early church, even going through persecution, was united. They recognized the importance of unity. Not only that, brethren, the unity that we're speaking of this morning is not the unity of some man-made religious groups out there that claim to be united, but they're divided every Lord's Day. You know, uh, there have been divisions in the Lord's Church, and we would be uh, remiss in our understanding if we didn't recognize there have been at times that there have been divisions that have arisen in the body of Christ. Paul said it was necessary. I, 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 I don't fully understand why he would say that, but he said there must needs be heresies among you. That they which are manifest, or that those which are, and, and I'm forgot, I, I'm trying to quote it and I've got it. Y'all know, know what I'm talking about. Uh, Paul said these heresies exist so that the people of God will stand out clearly but brethren, I want to tell you something. 
the divisions that we've had through the years will not hold a candle to the divisions that exist in man-made religions. And so if someone throws at us, well, you are divided. Say, look in your own history. And look at your own divisions. Because when you point that finger at us, you got three pointing back. I fully recognize there have been divisions in the Lord's church. So don't tell me there hasn't been divisions in denominationalism. The very word has the connotation of division. And so, brethren, the unity that the Bible talks about is described fully in Galatians chapter 3. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul tells us that the unity of the church was Jew and Gentile, bond and free, male and females, all becoming one in Christ Jesus. Let's read it. Galatians 3, verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you, verse 27, as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Listen to verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. But ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise. Brethren, we have demonstrated, I believe, very clearly the importance of unity. I want us to think about the basis of that unity. What are we united on? Well, there are several things that we could talk about, but let's turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, and we want to begin in verse number 1 where the Apostle Paul writes, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. How do we walk, Paul? Verse 2, all lowliness and meekness with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity, that's what we're talking about, we're talking about the basis of unity. Paul says in verse 3 that we are to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Brethren, the unity of the Spirit is what we're talking about. How does Paul tell us we can be united? Well, first of all, we recognize there's only one body. There's only one body. Look at Ephesians 2 and verse number 16. Ephesians 2 and verse 16. Jesus Christ in verse 13 came, verse 16, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. What did Paul say? That one of the reasons that Jesus came was to reconcile both. That's Jew and Gentile. He talks about it as we read a moment ago. In Galatians chapter 3, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female. So he tells us that one of the reasons that Jesus came was to bring together the Jews and the Gentiles. And he brought them together in one body. And brethren, if the Jews and Gentiles 2,000 years ago could meet together, and worship our God on the Lord's day, there's no excuse for us not to be able to come together and worship the God, worship God on the Lord's day today. Black or white, doesn't matter. The color of our skin is not relevant in the eyes of God. Jew, Gentile, consider different races, but they come together in one body, and Jesus died for that. That shows us, brethren, we can be united in one 
organization. There's no need for a multiplicity. Not only that, the one spirit that Paul talked about, we are united together in one spirit. Notice that this means that we are united on the revelation of God, the Holy Spirit. There is one spirit, the Bible says. That spirit gave one message and that's how we can be united. Look at John chapter 16. John chapter 16. And there are again a, a host of passages that we could look at to bring this out. But we just want to notice what Jesus told the apostles in John 16 and verse 13. And I want you to listen carefully to what Jesus said. How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. Brethren, there is no need for anybody today to ask for modern revelation. You've got a lot of people in the world, Lord, just speak to me. God, just give me a sign. God, just tell me this. God, just tell me that. God's told us all He's going to tell us right here in this book. And He's not going to whisper in your ears. He's not going to give you another message. I was talking to a guy several years ago, and he was telling me that an angel had come and uh, given him a revelation. He came to the office. He wanted to tell me what this, uh, this spirit said. And uh, this angel, he called it. And I said, well, how do you know it was an angel? He said, because the curtain stood straight up like it was flapping in the wind, but there was no breeze. That's how, that's how he knew an angel of God had come and spoken to him. And then he went on to explain. And I'm like, I don't know what, spirit that was <laughs> but I know it wasn't the Holy Spirit that's exactly right so he says how be it when he the spirit of truth is come he that is the spirit will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself but whatsoever he shall speak that he shall sp or he shall hear that shall he speak and he will show you things to come he verse number 14 the spirit will glorify me. That's Jesus. The Spirit will glorify Jesus. That's something that we need to talk about. We just don't have time this morning, so we'll save that for another time. One hope. Brethren, that is unity of focus, if we want to call it such. It's unity of aim. Listen, uh, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 1. And I want us to begin our reading in verse Number three, 1 Peter 1, verse 3, Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. There's one hope, and it's a living hope, Peter says, a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance, he says, incorruptible and undefiled. And it fadeth not away, and it's reserved in heaven for you. Brethren, that's unity of purpose, unity of focus, unity of aim. Brethren, he says we have one Lord. We're quoting from Ephesians chapter 4. He says there's one Lord. We recognize when uh, Paul said there's one Lord that he's talking about Jesus the Christ. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And notice what Paul wrote in verse number 6. But to us, in this discussion he's talking about idolatry and the, the foolishness of idolatry and that you've got all these little images that you've carved out by hand uh, that if a puff of wind can knock it over and you're going to bow down and worship that. So he says the foolishness of idolatry but to us, verse 6, there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in Him, listen to this, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by Him. Brethren, we recognize that Jesus Christ is the preeminent one. Colossians 1, in verse number 18, He is the head of the church. Ephesians chapter 1, we don't listen to men for our doctrine. We know that we have one Lord, and He has all authority. Matthew chapter 28, verse number 18. There is one faith. 
Brethren, that means we are united in doctrine. Turn with me to Jude, to the book of Jude. And what, are, what we're saying is we are united as the people of God on one doctrine. And that doctrine is the New Testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jude writes in Jude verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Uh, Jude is telling them, you know, brethren, I wanted to talk about the unity that we have or the, uh, the joy that we have in one, one common salvation. He said, that's what I wanted to write to you about. But the Holy Spirit said, no, no. <laughs> You're going to write about something else, Jude. You're going to tell them that he wants us. It was needful, he says, for me to write unto you and to exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. You could translate that once and for all delivered unto the saints. We have one faith. We are united in our doctrine. There is one baptism. Jesus told the apostles, not only did he have all power, all authority in Matthew 28, beginning in verse number 18, but he says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Brethren, we have unity of practice. You look at the religious world and the multiplicities of the plan of salvation is astonishing. Well, just accept Jesus into your heart. Just pray the sinner's prayer. Just do this. Just do that. And they have all these. And, 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 and brethren, we know. We know the moment we became a child of God. God was not unclear on this. He tells us. We read it a moment ago in Galatians 3 and verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized. Watch this into Christ I don't believe into Christ I believe on the Christ but belief does not put me into Jesus said in John chapter 10 I am the door brethren the only door into the body of Christ is through baptism we are baptized into Christ and all of us can stand together as the people of God. And I would dare say if we were to take a poll this morning that you could tell me the very day that you obeyed the gospel. You may not remember the exact date. I think a lot of us do. And I've said before, December 22nd, 1984. That's when I obeyed the gospel. And I know that. And, and, and being from a denominational background, and seeing the confusion that existed, and you talk to this guy and this guy. I've talked about this before. I'm, I'm not going to chase this rabbit very far. But years ago, we had a radio program out of Malakoff, at the, the radio station at Malakoff. Every Sunday morning, we had a 30-minute radio program. And one Sunday morning, in passing, I was talking about baptism and I, I put out this statement or something along this line. I said, I just want you to go to every preacher in the Cedar Creek Lake area and ask them, what must I do to be saved? Just go and ask them. And I said on that radio program, you will hear contradictory answers. You will hear answers that are far-fetched and just some of them crazy. Several months later, I got a call from a guy named Joe. He called. He said, is this Kerry Clark? I said, yes. He said, you the preacher on the radio? I said, yes, sir, that's me. And he goes, do you remember what you said a couple of months ago on the radio? And I'm like, well, no, Joe, tell me, what did I say? And he said, I, he said you challenged me to call every preacher on Cedar Creek Lake or go ask. He said, I've done that. I'm like, really? He said, yes, sir. 
And he said, I want you to know you were exactly right. Confusion. Disagreement. I said, Joe, call all the churches of Christ in this area. Ask them that question. And he did. And guess what we all said? Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Brethren, we all, if we're standing true to the Word of God, that's what we practice. Not only that, we believe there's one God. One God. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 4. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Moses is giving the law of Moses to that new generation. Their parents had died in the wilderness. Forty years later, this new generation arises. They're about to enter into the promised land. And he told them in Deuteronomy 6 and verse number 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Brethren, that's crystal clear. So why then should we be united? We've already covered this, so this is going to be kind of a review. We've talked about it in the importance of it. But brethren, Jesus prayed for this kind of unity. The church is glorified in this kind of unity. Remember what we read in John 17 in verse number 22? The church is glorious because we practice this unity. And then as we began our study, how beautiful to see God's people dwelling together in unity. So that leads us to the closing point. What would hinder the unity of the people of God? Well, there could be a lot of reasons. I've got four that I'm going to give you. One of them, uh, you're looking at your outline, you're saying, you can't count, there's only three there. I added one. <laughs> so, so just understand, you can add this to your notes when we get to it. But first of all, brethren, one of the greatest hindrances to the unity of the people of God is for us to preach and teach our opinions. 1 Peter chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4, and verse number 11. Peter tells us, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And when we start preaching opinions and binding opinions, my opinion counts more than your opinion. And so you can go to 2 Opinions chapter 3 and verse number 8 and, I, and I'll tell you what I believe. And then we want to draw a line and say this is, this is, this is the way it's got to be. Well, brethren, that causes division. That hinders the unity of Christ. One of the things that we don't talk about, I'm convinced enough, selfishness hinders the unity of Christ. We need to be following in the steps of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 4, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. He tells us in verse 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Brethren, when we are selfish with our time, when we are selfish with our money, when we are selfish with our prayers, just continue down the list. When we are selfish with our love, we are hindering the unity of the body of Christ. And brethren, when we do that, it is sinful. It is sinful for us to conduct ourselves in that fashion. Not only that, brethren, you've got loyalty to a man. And you know what I'm talking about. Uh, the, the word, and I don't hear this word much uh, anymore, but it was not uncommon years ago to hear somebody say, well, they've got preacheritis. they got preacheritis. What does that mean? I'm going to follow a man. I'm going to follow a preacher. And brethren, sadly, there are too many of us that our allegiance is to a man and not Jesus Christ. Well, brother so-and-so wrote such and such, and I'm so thankful, and I'm saying this sincerely. I am thankful, thankful for men in the past who have written commentary when I'm talking about brothers in Christ. 
not, not the old commentator, but a commentary <laughs> written by a faithful man. I, I, I appreciate and love that men took the time to write that would help me. But brethren, we don't believe what we believe because Guy and Woods wrote it. We don't believe what we believe because Thomas Warren said it. Roy Deaver said it. You can go down the list. Those are men that influenced me greatly. And I'm telling you, we cannot have loyalty to a man. As much as I love those men, I disagree with them. And they can get right. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but, you know, uh, you just look at some of the things they say and you're like, brother, where did you get that? The fourth thing. Brethren, pride. Remember Proverbs 6 and verse 16. Remember where we started talking about that list of seven things that are an abomination in the eyes of God? And do you remember Solomon in his wisdom said, first of all, a proud look? He ended with the one who would sow discord among the people of God. I want you to know that Solomon tells us in Proverbs 13 and verse number 10, only by pride cometh contention. Brethren, personal pride has divided the body of Christ, way too many times. Only by pride, he says, cometh contention, but with the well advised is wisdom. So brethren, this unity that the Bible declares is a sign. Do you remember what Jesus said in John 17? When we are united together as the people of God and the world sees that, they know we're Christians. We even used to sing a song, I think we still do occasionally, they'll know we're Christians by our love, by our love, by our love. Well, do we demonstrate that to the world? And brethren, one of the things that we must, as difficult as it is, when a brother or sister is being divisive, we have to stand up to it. And we have to say, you need to stop and you need to repent. So this beautiful idea of unity. I love Psalm 133. How good and how pleasant it is for the people of God to dwell together in unity. It's like that oil that Moses pulled over, poured over Aaron's head. It's like that dew on Mount Hermon, that dew on Mount Zion that sparkles in the sunlight. That's the kind of unity that we're talking about this morning. And if you want to be united with this cause, we mentioned it a moment ago. I'm going to go back over it very briefly. Remember when Joe called all the churches of Christ and he got the same answer. You hear the word of God, you believe that word, you repent of your sins, you confess that Jesus is the Christ, and you be baptized for the remission of your sins. That's pretty simple, I think. If you've never done that this morning, Brother Britt's going to lead us in an invitation song. We're pleading with you to respond to the gospel. As a child of God, if you have need, we encourage you to come as we stand and sing.